All right, in this episode, I'm going to talk about subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So this is uh, formally how we define it. Uh, let's take any extensive form game with set of players, histories, etc. A mixed strategy profile Sigma star is a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium or simply subgame perfect equilibrium in mixed strategies of our game if Sigma star induces a Nash equilibrium in every subgame of this game. Well, what does it mean that Sigma star induces a Nash equilibrium in every subgame? Well, we mean Again, for more formally, Sigma star is an SPNE subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of our game if the continuation strategy uh, that follows uh, history H in, uh, in the set of continuation strategies, uh, continuation strategy profile, I'm sorry, um, is a Nash equilibrium of the continuation game or of the subgame, and this should be true for any histories, uh, non-terminal histories, meaning for every subgame, your continuation strategy, uh, not your strategy, continuation strategy profile must uh, be a Nash equilibrium of this subgame. All right, that's it. Well, what I would like to uh, underline is the following. What if I look at behavioral strategies? Doesn't matter. Uh, it's just a matter of notation. So take any extensive form game. A behavioral strategy profile. Remember, we don't denote it by sigma, but beta star in this fat B set is a subgame perfect equilibrium in behavioral strategies. All right of this game if beta star induces a Nash equilibrium in every sub-game of uh, the original game. More formally, the beta star, which is coming from this uh, fat B set, is an SPNE of the original game if the continuation uh, behavioral strategy profiles, which is Oh, well, by the way, this S was wrong, right? It should be, it should have been Sigma H. I'm sorry for my typo uh, because, you know, continuation mixed strategy profile is coming from the set of uh, mixed strategy profiles of the continuation game. So that is also coming from B, the fat B set restricted to H. Uh, is an Nash equilibrium of uh, the sub game. And this has to be true for any history. Okay, as simple as this. So it really doesn't matter whether you use mixed strategy or pure strategy definition or behavioral strategy. The definition is the same, all right? Nothing is changing. Um, and also mixed strategy, behavioral strategy definitions are equivalent because if something, if, if, a, if a mixed strategy is a Nash equilibrium, well, we know that there's outcome equivalent behavioral strategy Nash equilibrium, uh, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, all right? Well, uh, what about the intuition? So let me tell you a few things about it. So if you remember the intuition I tried to give you earlier, a Nash equilibrium is a kind of uh, a strategy profile which uh, checks a uh, regret freeness check uh, if for, for each player. Uh, but, but what is the idea? So the idea is the following. So the Nash equilibrium looks at simultaneous move game. So players simultaneously choose a strategy and then they submit it to someone and then uh, that person reveals all the strategies chosen and tells them what payoff they're going to receive. So the thing is, once the game is over, uh, well, uh, the, each player looks at his payoff. I mean, his strategy, he knows it, and the other's strategy. He says, well, I mean, there are two things. I wasn't expecting my opponents to play that. Uh, well, you know what? Uh, too late, too bad. There's nothing I can do about it. That wasn't my expectation. So therefore, I did a very poor, I got a very poor or terrible payoff, but there's nothing I can do at this point. So I'm not going to regret if my expectation, my conjecture about my opponent's strategy play is... is is, is happened to be, I mean, happens to be different than my conjecture. Well, but what if my opponents play exactly as I was expecting them to play? 
Well, in that case, am I going to regret? No. Why? Well, because I was best responding this conjecture and this conjecture happened to be correct. So you know what? I did the best I could do in this game. So I'm not going to regret. Okay. Well, what about, so that's the idea of Nash equilibrium, but what about the sub game perfect Nash equilibrium? Hmm. Well, here you don't have to make this uh, regret freeness check uh, until the end of the game. All right. You can say, well, you know what? Okay. Some things happened. And then given that the original strategy I picked, is it still optimal? I mean, I mean, maybe, well, if unexpected things happened, well, I can still have time to make it correct. All right. So therefore maybe sticking to my original strategy is, is no good idea because I can remember in, in the Nash equilibrium concept, it is a concept for simultaneous one shot game. And if your opponents behave unexpectedly, well, there's nothing you can do because the game is over, bro. But here the game is not over yet. It's just, you know, few things happen, but from now on you may be able to change few things. And so you can actually check whether you're going to be regretting your strategy that you picked originally or not, even before the game is over. All right, so this is the difference between Nash equilibrium and subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. I hope that intuition was clear. In order to sort of make this intuition uh, clearer, hopefully, let me talk about this very simple, probably you all know about it, entry deterrence game. Player one uh, decides to enter to the market or not. If he, if he doesn't enter, he's going to get zero payoff. His opponent will enjoy the monopoly profit. If he enters, his opponent has two options. It can fight, in which case like price competition, they both are going to get negative one payoff, or they can just split the profit one and one. All right. Well, it is simple to analyze this game, at least for Nash equilibrium and also sub game perfect Nash equilibrium. How so? Well, play, player one has two strategies, stay out or enter, right? Player two also two strategies, fight or don't fight. And then the strategic form game representation is going to be, well, if the player one chooses out, it really doesn't matter what player two does. But if he enters, well, then depending on the second player's choices, the payoffs will be either minus one, minus one, or plus one, plus one. Well, in pure strategies, forget about mixed strategies, but in pure strategies, what are the Nash equilibria? Well, uh, both of those strategies are best response to O, only this one is D is the best response to E, and then here the best responses are here and here. So these are two pure strategy Nash equilibrium outcomes. And in terms of strategies, the first one is OF and the other one is ED. These are Nash equilibrium strategies, remember? Well, what about the sub game? Well, in the sub game, we use the backward induction. At least backward induction is so useful, but it is so powerless when the game is a very complicated or infinite horizon. So in a very simple game like this, I can use backward induction. How? Well, if E happens, player two is going to look forward. He can choose fight and get minus one or don't get one. Obviously, he's going to go for D. Well, given that, right, player one can reason and say, you know, well, why am I staying out? Because I'm going to get zero. I know my opponent is not an idiot, so he's going to choose D. So, you know what? I should also choose E. So the backward induction says, in fact, one of those Nash equilibrium is not optimal. ED is the only optimal solution or 1-1 one, one is the optimal solution. Well, why is it subgame perfect Nash equilibrium? Because this game has two subgames. One subgame is the game itself and, and there's another subgame, which is a proper subgame, uh, after history A, E, I'm sorry. So this is where player two makes a move is a subgame. Well, you're going to say it is not a game because it's just one person. Well, it's the simplest possible game you can think of. Player two is going to make it. So what is the Nash equilibrium here? Well, because player two doesn't have any opponent, player two maximizing his uh, payoff is the Nash equilibrium strategy. So it's D. All right. Well, therefore, remember 
the restriction of you know sigma star b star whatever should form Nash equilibrium in every subgame. So the restriction of this strategy profile in this subgame, which means ignore O, F is the restricted strategy. Is it is it Nash equilibrium of this game? No, it is not. So therefore, but but here D is a Nash equilibrium of this game. So you know what? This is the SP &E, the only SP &E in pure strategies. But once again. That regret freeness idea, it says, look, OF. So the Nash asks the following. Suppose the game is over, all right? Period one, period two, and over. Now I ask you the following question. Uh, your opponent was expected to play O. I mean, you were playing, uh, I'm sorry, you, you were um, hoping that your opponent is going to play F. Well, the thing is, uh, well, obviously, once you play O, your opponent did no chance, opportunity to play in this game. So basically, this will not be realized. And so you will never be able to learn your opponent's strategy. And hence, you're not going to regret anything because you don't know what he would do. Right? You just, you know, leave with your conjecture. However, however, if you choose E, all right? Well, what is going to happen? Well, your opponent, player two, is going to look, well, you know what? Initially, I was chosen this strategy, F, fight. Uh, but the thing is, unexpected thing happened and the game is not yet over, right? My opponent was expected to play, I was expecting him to play O, but he played E. So, all right, uh, should I still continue with fight? Well, I'm going to get minus one. Clearly, it's not optimal. So I make, I'm sorry, not I. The second player is going to make this regret freeness check after something unexpected happens. And he will definitely change his mind. So once he see that you played E, I mean, player one played E, he will certainly not commit play F. He will change it. So therefore, knowing this, player one should know that his opponent's strategy F is actually not regret-free. He will regret from choosing this strategy at the beginning of the game very much if I show him something unexpected and play E. So therefore, I shouldn't play O, all right? So this strategy is all the nonsense, all the non-credible threat. But this one makes a lot of sense because here, uh, the unexpected thing is, well, I mean, let's say player one played O. So that's the unexpected unexpected thing. Well, but the thing is player two will still not regret from this. Why is that? Well, I mean, the game is over. There's nothing he could do, all right? So uh, what about player one? Well, player one, if he does something unexpected, of course he will regret. For that reason, he's not gonna do something unexpected from him. He's gonna choose E, but once he chooses E, is player two is going to regret from his choice D? Well, no, because uh, he's getting one. Otherwise, if he uh, plays F, he's going to get minus one. All right. So this is why we need this Nash equilibrium in every subgame. So in every subgame, players are re-optimizing their strategies uh, given the history. All right, so initially, maybe they thought some histories are not possible, they're impossible, they weren't expecting it, but the thing is, it, they may happen. So if they do happen, all right, if they do happen, well, are they going to stick to their strategies or not? Well, so a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium strategy profile is a strategy profile or strategy for each player so that at any point of the game, Whenever a player makes a regret freeness check, he's gonna say, well, you know what? Expected or unexpected things happen. Who cares? I am happy with what I'm doing, all right? So it is much stronger than Nash Equilibrium, um, but nevertheless, every game has at least one subgame perfect Nash Equilibrium strategy. Maybe in pure strategies, maybe in mix or behavioral, doesn't matter, but every finite game, I'm sorry, I should take it back, every finite game has at least one subgame perfect Nash Equilibrium.